And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast on a beautiful Monday afternoon on the East Coast where we are one week into what promises to be maybe the craziest NBA season of all time, one of the craziest NBA seasons of all time. And before we get into what has happened in that week, I just want to remind everybody, particularly residents of Cleveland and Orlando and a few other places, nigh seven years ago, the first version of the process era Philadelphia 76ers, filled with beloved NBA characters, began the season 3-0. and And on this date, or the equivalent of this date in October 2013, a Monday, boy, the internet was full of takes. How are the process Sixers doing this? What if they're better than we thought? Oh my God, Michael Carter Williams to Spencer Hawes. Spencer Hawes is spacing the floor for Thaddeus Young. What if we were all wrong about the process Sixers? No, spoiler alert, we were not wrong. They were terrible. Last year, last year, the Minnesota Timberwolves started the season 3-0 and amid much doubt. Kendrick Perkins on TV said he was sleeping, not only sleeping on the Minnesota Timberwolves, he was sleeping with the air conditioning on, windows open, having a great nap, and the Wolves started 3-0. and And do you know what whoever runs their social media account did? Tweeted at Kendrick Perkins. You still sleeping at us? Something like that. You still sleeping on us, Kendrick? And Kendrick was like, yeah, I'm still sleeping on you. Still, yeah, 3-0, and I don't care, which was the appropriate response. Minnesota went on to be 7-4, and four, and they doubled down on social media. They tweeted when they were 7-4, and four, the Wolves are going to be bad this season in that capital letter lowercase alteration, alternation that I don't really understand what that is or where it's from. And it had, a, it had a clip below it of Carl Towns making a funny face like, oh, really? Really? The Timberwolves are going to be bad this season? We're 7-4. and four. Guess what? The Timberwolves were really, really bad. Super bad. They sucked. And I have to say... Props to the Timberwolves people because they kept those tweets up. They did not delete those tweets. A lesser person would have deleted those tweets. A lesser organization would have deleted those tweets. I might have deleted those tweets. Like Ted Leonsis once deleted his post about how Jordan Crawford and Andre Blatch and I think Nick Young were going to be the next, no, it must have been John Wall, were going to be the next big three, the new big three in Washington. That blog post is deleted. You can't get it anymore on tedstake.com.edu.org. You can't get it. Okay, but the Timberwolves kept it up, which is just my way of saying, Cleveland, you're 3-0. and It's awesome. You beat the Hornets. You beat the Pistons, who stink like holy hell. You beat the Sixers without Joel Embiid. You're frisky. The sex land backcourt, hat tip Larry Nance Jr., killing it. Andre Drummond having a great start to the season. There's some interesting stuff happening in Cleveland. You're not going to – it's not going to – this isn't going to last. Orlando, 3-0. and Okay. I wrote off the Orlando Magic before the season. I said, I'm done with them. I think they know they're done with themselves. I had them in like maybe to get the 10th or the 9th seed in the East. And that's for an incumbent playoff team whose core minus some injuries is mostly intact. 3-0. and Offense killing it. I think they're number three in the league in offense. Number two in free throw rate after years of being allergic to getting to the free throw line at all. Uh, fine. They, they beat Miami and then they beat the Wizards twice. The Wizards didn't have Russell Westbrook the last time. I'm not that impressed. I'm a little impressed. I'm, I'm impressed with Markel Fultz being 12 of 13 from the line. I thought um, Markel Fultz going from the 50 percentages, 50 percentile to 73 percent at the line last year was sort of an under the radar storyline and sign of progress. So it's it's cool. I just I just need to see it for a little longer. I'm just I'm not ready to crown anybody like the Timberwolves crowned themselves last year. But you can learn some stuff through three or four games, or you can think you can learn some stuff from three or four games. And so to digest the whirlwind of the first week of the NBA season, where all I do is just sit down and mainline basketball right into my veins for many, many hours a day. One of the best in the business, author of an upcoming book about the 90s Knicks that I will devour. I will devour that thing like Harry Potter book seven. I'll take it into my backyard and pretend it's Central Park and just sit there and read it until the sun goes down. From 538, Chris Herring, how are you? Zach, I'm, I'm great. I appreciate you as always. Uh, so I'll be a little bit lighter on what I was going to say a minute ago. You just took like a, not completely, because there was nuance to it, like there always is with what you do, but took like a a sword to the balloons that these fans have in Orlando and, and Cleveland, man. Like, yeah, they'll probably not end up in the playoffs, but let, let these sleep. No, hey, hey, look, bit. hey, look. I had the I had the Cavs in my bottom tier in my tiers with Detroit, 
New York, who, by the way, just, I don't even know what the hell happened at Madison Square Garden last night. When Frank Nilakina hit his 4-3 of the game with a hand in his face off the dribble, I actually stepped back from my computer for a second and was like, I just need to verify that I'm awake, that this, yes. that this is a game that I'm watching, that this is not a hoax, that this is not a dream. And I can't remember who else was. Oh, Oklahoma City was in that bottom tier. But I did write the Cavs of all these teams have the most potential to be frisky because I think their offense is going to be pretty good. And that has happened. And Orlando, hey, look, there's a lot of pride on that team. Like the veterans on that team are proud. It's always well coached under Steve Clifford. So maybe they're a little better than I thought. I don't want to just pop the balloon. Let people be happy. If there's a year where people can just be happy. If Cleveland fans want to come out today and anoint Sexland, the next Splash Brothers, and Larry Nance is now the best starting small forward in the league after starting one game there yesterday against the Sixers, I'm fine. You know what? I don't care. Like, ha- have at it. But anyway, Mr. Herring, how are you? I'm, I'm doing okay, man. Uh, happy holidays to you and everybody that's listening. But uh, I'm doing well. Santa did Santa did pretty well here at the Low Household. Santa did pretty good. Remote control car, good times. Crashed into the wall immediately and dented the wall, like within 30 seconds. Um, the biggest story in the league today, let's start here. The Brooklyn Nets come flying out of the gates, dismantle the Warriors, dismantle the Celtics on Christmas. Um look fantastic on both ends of the floor. Even as of now, they are the number two defense in the league after three games, which is definitely a stat that you should read a lot into uh, after three games. Um, And then lose a weird game to the Hornets last night who looked terrible in their first two games. Kevin Durant misses a very Duranty shot, just a perfect baseline pull up to try to tie the game at the end. Uh, Weird loss, but you know, look, it's one loss. The Nets look awesome. And then today we get news that Spencer Dinwiddie has a partially torn ACL and may be out for the season. Uh, I think it's it's you know Spencer has not played well. I think he's averaging six points. A, he's not he's not shot well. I think he's averaging six and a half points a game. He's shot horribly from everywhere. I still think it's it's a potentially significant loss. Uh, what are your what's your initial sort of reaction to how big a deal it is? How they move on from it? And just sort of like what you think that what you conceive of the Nets as a team? So I, I think it's a big injury, and I, I don't want to take away from just the personal side of it. I. Uh, I find myself thinking a lot more, you know, and you, you kind of suggested it a few minutes ago, just with regards to the kind of year that we're all having um, that, you know, Spencer, if I remember correctly, he had the virus at one point. He, he did. And he was, he was one of the players. I mean, he did, it's not like he got super in depth, I don't think, or maybe he didn't, I missed it, but he's one of the players for whom it was not just a, a little, like I barely noticed it speed bump. He noticed Right. It. So there's that aspect of it. There's the injury part of it. Um, which, you know, ACLs are not, when you tick off the, the list of injuries that you can have in this sport, this is not, you know, this is not an insignificant sort of injury. Um, you know, thank goodness that he got his contract, you know, depending on how you view it. I, I know a lot of fans are going to look at it and say, ah, shoot, you know, that's kind of money now that is allocated differently than you would have done that if you knew he'd get hurt, obviously. But, um, you know, thank goodness for his personal sake that he, you know, that he got his contract and his money. Um, so just from a personal standpoint, it sucked for him, a guy that, um, you know, I think a lot of people are happy for him around the league, just kind of his career arc and the way the first couple of years looked and not really finding the right home for him. And, and he's really flourished there in Brooklyn. So that part of it, I feel awful. Um, from the net standpoint, like you said, this is a, this is a contender, maybe a little bit quicker than I thought. Um, I know it's obvious to say they're a contender when you look at Durant and, and Kyrie, but, um, the way that they score just so easily and all the shooting they have and all the options they have, now you're losing one option. And, and quite frankly, um, you know, now you have to kind of raise the question of like what you do with your bench rotation. Um, do you use Levert as a starter? Do you want to do that? Does it make things too top heavy with this team, which I think is kind of one of the questions you have already with your top two guys. Um, my question for the Nets really and watching them even now, even with them being number two in the league of defense is that probably won't hold up for them. I don't like, they're not a bad defensive team. I don't think that they're an elite defensive team. And I kind of feel like when I look at their roster um, that at some point when they start playing teams, when we get deeper into the season, they're going to see, you know, once it kind of wears off for Kyrie and Durant, to some extent, the effort they're playing with defensively, 
you might want to upgrade defensively with this team somewhere. And if you're doing that, what are you giving up to do it? And to some extent, Dinwiddie is one of those guys where the amount of depth you have with all your scores, you could have afforded to give him up. We've obviously heard Levert's name come up already with regards to the hard stuff. So now all of a sudden it makes that a little bit tighter and you're going to be, you have to be a lot more careful because you don't have as much scoring now. And if you don't have as much scoring, do you need the defense even more than you would have needed it before just because you could blow teams out before? All right, let, let's start by addressing the elef- what Steve Nash has called the elephant in the room, which is James Harden. I saw a lot of stuff on, on the tweet machine today about how, uh, well, this just blows up any hopes of the Nets acquiring James Harden. Let, let, let me, that's not true. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie's health did not make or break the Nets' ability to get James Harden. And it's it's unclear to me, frankly, if, if those teams have had anything even resembling a serious conversation about James Harden. Let's make that clear. Um, I, I don't sense that there's been hardly any traction there at all. And, and maybe the way the Nets started had them thinking, well, why, why are we messing with, why are we messing with yep. this? Um, but, but if they wanted to mess with it, Spencer Dinwiddie's health on a player option was not – I mean, look, Spencer Dinwiddie's good. Houston would like to have a good player on their team. What was going to make or break that theoretical trade was either how much draft equity the Nets were going to put in, how how unprotected all of it or some of it would be, what years it would be in. And if that was not even enough, then could they go get a third player, a third team with a young player that the Rockets wanted? Spencer Dinwiddie's health is not immaterial to the trade, but it's pretty damn close to immaterial. Regarding his place on the Nets – um, to your point, their starting lineup has been destroying people. I think they're plus 32 in like 40 minutes together already. And I agree with you that they profile as a team if they are going to be a championship contender. And I had the, I was super high on them. I had them in the inner circle of contenders right off the bat. It was going to be with a profile of like top three offense, ninth to 12th in defense, something like that. And Part of their top three offense, which they haven't had yet, but looks fine to me, is I think there was real power for this team in having three really good ball handlers on the floor at the same time. And that in the starting lineup, that's Kyrie, KD, and Dinwiddie. And Dinwiddie may look almost superfluous as a a third ball handler and not a great spot-up shooter. But one thing I think the Nets leaned into, and it was clear very early, was we are going to play fast. Because we have a lot of guys who can dribble. We have a lot of guys who can bring it up. We have a ton of shooting. Not only that, we're going to play a lot of games where the matchups are super scrambled. Because we switch a lot on defense. The other team is going to want specific guys on KD and Kyrie because they're that damn good. And if we get a stop, all of that is going to create this swirl of chaos where teams are trying to find the right matchup. And oh I'm not supposed to be guarding KD, but KD's next to me. He's a foot taller than me. This is a disaster. I'm whatever. And in that chaos come open three-pointers and dunks if you have enough guys who can shoot and really dribble at a high level. And so that's why Spencer Dinwiddie, although he's averaging six, he has 20 points in three games and is on the surface superfluous, was not to that lineup. That raises the next question you brought up is, do they then promote Levert, who they have sold as Manu 2.0, as that third elite ball handler in the starting five. My hunch is they don't want to do that, that they want to keep the bench rotation largely intact. Um, I could see Torian Prince getting a look. I could see Luau Cabro, who hit three threes last night, getting a look. Um, I And I also could see them looking at that, and you know what, and saying, you know what, maybe the simplest option is just we start Karis LeVert and we stagger the minutes so that our bench rotations are, are similar. I don't know. Certainly, there are ways to minimize the impact of of the hit. The Nets are a super deep team, but I do think it forces them to stretch a little bit. And obviously, their their margin for another injury or or Kyrie just sitting out games or whatever, KD just sitting out games is a little thinner. So I, I think I think it's a meaningful loss to a team that, frankly, was about looked looked about ready to go. Like looked about ready to be like, no, no, we're not we're not just some fake contender. We're like we're legit. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's hard not to, it, it's funny, like, I, I feel like uh, the podcast that uh, I did with Windhorse and Kirk Goldsberry recently, um, we <laughs> kind of talked in advance about which teams we wanted to discuss beforehand, and I think we picked the Nets and the Sixers, and then both teams <laughs> lost last night as we were talking, and so, was, you know, trying to figure out how dominant these teams are right off the bat, 
Uh, you know, you, you might lose one of those first three or four games, whatever. But we saw enough in those first two from the Nets to know that this is going to be a team that you really have to reckon with as far as all the options they've got on offense. And this changes that just from the standpoint of who all's available, who all can you play together, and just the comfortability that I think uh, Nash had developed. Uh, we're not going to stagger these guys, uh, at least early on. And now I think that becomes much more of a realistic sort of thing, um, especially if you decide that you want to play Levert with that starting five, because I think that is going to be the biggest adjustment here. If you move Levert into that first five, um, there are moments where Levert comes down and nobody touches the ball on offense for three plays with him um, and that bench group. And so just by definition of him being that ball dominant within that group, um, if you're going to move him into the starting lineup, like that whole second unit becomes totally different if you move him out of that. And so just by definition, I feel like you might have to move Kyrie or Durant into that group and then, you know, maybe have them switch off at times. Yeah. To your, their, their second most played lineup behind the starters is the bench mob of Lavert, Shamit, Prince green and Jared Allen. Um, and Prince is a guy Boy, I'm getting tired of waiting on Torian Prince, and I wonder if the Nets are getting tired of waiting on Torian Prince. He's one of 11 from the floor in three games. He has one basket in three games, and he's still so deep in his own head in terms of the player he thinks he can be, the player the Nets need him to be, when he should shoot, when he should drive, when he should pass. And I do think he's just got to, like, there's a good useful player in there that he's just got to work his way out of whatever mental funk and uncertainty he's in. And the only way he's going to do that is by playing. And there's part of me that wonders as underwhelming as he has been now in a year and a half or whatever with the nets or whatever it is now, I wonder if even starting him just for the sake of trying to light a fire under his ass might be some, or just clarify his role or whatever it is might help, but it would become even tougher to, to thrive in a situation. I don't know if it makes it easier or tougher. Like you said, it kind of, it it would be a weird move because it it both is a confidence boost. Maybe, I don't know, uh, depending on kind of the way he thinks, but also throws him into a situation where the shots probably become a little bit fewer for him too. If you throw him into a lineup with Kyrie and Durant, but I, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think there's more pressure now on you. You have to hit shots when you're in lineups with those guys because they're going to be throwing everything they have at two guys in a lineup or at Levert when you're in a lineup like that. And you've got other guys that can shoot on that team. And so if you can't, um, it doesn't really bode well for your ability to stay in the lineup every night. Yeah. Look, I really like the Nets. I think Steve Nash has them playing the right way. They're, they're number one in. Um, the percentage of their possessions that come in transition, according to cleaning the glass, they're about 10th in pace. So they're not running all the time, but they're running when they get a chance. Um, they're playing Durant at center. Like they're just, they're playing. They came out looking like a team that knew what they were and how they could play. And I do think this sets them back as, as almost replaceable is too strong, but I, I, Dinwiddie doesn't seem that significant on this team. In the long run, I do think, if they have good health up and down the rest of the roster and one guy pops off that bench that hasn't popped yet, maybe it's TLC, maybe Bruce Brown emerges, maybe Shamit starts to make shots. I mean, no one else is making threes on their team outside the two stars. Um, I think they can weather it and be about where they were as a, in terms of championship equity with Dinwiddie, but but certainly their margin for error is, uh, is a little bit less. Uh, let's change gears and change conferences and talk about uh, a team that doesn't appear to have any margin for error at all. Um, certainly an interesting team three games in, and that's the Golden State Warriors, who are 1-2, and two, uh, 29th in offense, 26th in defense, and a Damian Lee buzzer-beating three away from being 0-3. And, and that three, of course, came against the Bulls, who are... Oh, Bad. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I, 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 I just... I look at the Bulls and I, they seem shiny to me before every season. I get a little too exuberant about the Bull. Maybe this is the year for marketing. I don't know. And then they come out and they stink. Um, so the Warriors, uh, obviously Draymond has not played yet, which, again, sometimes the most obvious thing is the biggest thing, right? It's like the Sixers get swept in the first round of the playoffs and the ninth paragraph is Ben Simmons didn't play. When That should probably be the first paragraph. The first paragraph should probably be Draymond Green hasn't played yet. 
Uh, Steph has not shot it well. Came alive late, late last uh, last night against the Bulls. Um, Wiggins is Wiggins and Ubre are four of thirty combined on threes. Ubre has not made a three. He's zero of seventeen. I think Tom Hepperstro had a stat that he's missed every shot that is not a dunk so far this season, which is yeah. I got really a stat for you before you even finish here. Uh, go Kaius go. Duncan tweeted. I don't remember who he cited, so I guess maybe his Twitter account would have it. <laughs> of guys that have taken at least 10 layups this season, um, the two guys with the worst percentages in the league are Ubre worst, and then Wiggins, number two, for worst in the entire league at layups. And so it's not just the threes. It's it's just everywhere. And it's – think about how brutal that is with a team where guys are racing at step to get the ball out of his hands. And you've got a mismatch because of it. And it's basically just a race to the basket to see can Wiggins finish, can Ubre finish, you know, because they're not taking threes because other teams don't trust them to make those shots. And they're not even finishing the layups. So it's just been a brutal – I mean, it, and thank goodness for them that they got the win over the Bulls, you know, in that fashion. But it's just – I don't know. Draymond's not there. Clay's not there. You know, Draymond will be back. But it just kind of feels like there's so much that needs to be fixed here that I'm not sure that Draymond does it to even put them in a position where they're really challenging for that eight seed. Not yet, at least. I'm- let 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 me let me be let me be the bearer of some optimism for the Warriors. I mean, optimism. I don't know, but let me just you know again. I'm trying to be happy. Like throw the parade in Cleveland. I'm trying to be happy and positive. Okay. Uh, through three games, the Warriors are shooting 48% at the rim. That's last. The Washington Generals might shoot better than 47% at the 48%. rim. 48%. They have to be last by a, a decent amount, right? Yep. Five full percentage Ooh. points over your fight in New York Knicks. Um, they are shooting 30% on threes. That's 25th. Their opponents are shooting 46% on threes. That's the highest in the league that any defense is giving up. So, a little bit of bad luck, whatever. Like, Kelly Oubre is a league average three-point shooter. He's not going to shoot 0% for much longer. Wiggins is what he is. Like, I just, I've just i I've been mostly out on Wiggins for a while. I'm on the verge of being all the way out. Um, but this team is not this bad. And I do think Draymond's return could make a difference. But it's just, it's so interesting because, you know, Steph moving around and roaming about off the ball has been so effective for them in past years. And you realize that, like, everyone focuses on the lack of spacing, right? Like, when Steph runs a pick and roll, no one is guarding Wiggins. I mean, to the degree that it's now embarrassing. If Wiggins is on the perimeter, his guy is just nowhere near, no, nowhere nearby. Ubre is now being treated the same way. Uh, Wiseman has made some jumpers, but he's a center. Nobody really cares. Um, and, you know, whoever they start at four, whether it's Toscano Anderson or Eric Pascal, no one is guarding that guy. The spacing is obvious. We can all see it. Steph drives and there's just there's just people everywhere. It's more interesting to me when he starts moving around, you realize he is very effective at that and will always be because he's the greatest shooter ever. But part of the reason he was so effective at it is because the guys screening for him or for whom he was screening were good passers and that's gotten a lot of play. They're good passers. And when they're good passers, they make good, quick decisions with the ball. They flip screens. They're just smart. Play Andre Iguodala, Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, the smart, Draymond Green, some of the smartest players of all time, but also good shooters. Like how many times did Steph and Clay come together off the ball and the defense just panicked and started running around with no idea what to do? Because it's like, oh my God, the Splash Brothers are screening for each other. We don't know which way they're going to go. It's a panic. And now it's like, Steph is getting a screen from Andrew Wiggins and they're, you know, yeah, maybe Andrew Wiggins can cut to the basket um, and and theoretically he can dunk. But if the three guys on the other side of the player behind that play also can't shoot, well, someone's going to be in Andrew Wiggins way pretty fast and he's going to have to make a quick read and the next guy's going to have to make a quick read and the whole possession's going to die. It's the lack of shooting and passing amongst the other players does not just infect the Warriors offense in obvious ways. It it makes Steph's off ball movement a little bit less dangerous. And that's been very, very obvious in these first three games. Yeah, that, that's a huge part of it because I mean, for years, I remember I wrote about this at one point and was like kind of amazed even, you, you know, obviously there, there are so many superlative statistics, you know, that the Warriors have had over the years, but 
Um, and we talk all the time about the screen assist that Rudy Gobert has. That you know. I, Oh, no more. No more. Exactly. Screen assist is, is now screen assist is now beeped on this podcast. He got paid. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to hear Matt Harpering say, oh, did you guys know Rudy? Rudy Gobert, 10 screen assists. Did you guys, did anyone know? Has any fan ever heard of a screen assist? We actually track screen assist now. Every game the Jazz are like, hey, did you guys know we actually track? We all know. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not uh, the name that will not be spoken. I won't mention him, but Steph, Steph is, you know, kind of the unheralded guard version of that, um, which you wouldn't expect that mostly because he has the ball so much and because he's obviously shooting so much. And so he's had moments in years where he's basically leading the league in that as a guard, but it's because he forces so much action his way. Maybe he's not forcing it, but other teams feel the need to, to go and race two, three guys at him. And so, like you said, if there's not good enough passing on the floor, and, th- and they do have moments, I think um, Anthony Slater – it posted something kind of looking at the looks that Wiggins is getting off these drives just to pass to other people. But some of that is that he's not being pressured that hard because it's like, okay, we're not afraid of Wiggins shooting it. And we're not really even that afraid of him trying to lay it up because he's, these guys just aren't finishing at the rim. And so there are cleaner looks for him to make a pass to other people. But um, all told on this roster, you're right. There's not enough passing They'll get Draymond back, and that will absolutely help. Now, I, I think my concern is just that they, these are guys that don't know. and These are all young guys, relatively young guys, playing for them, and they're just not known as defenders. You know, Oubre is, is nice here and there, certainly athletic. Um, you know, Wiseman is, is athletic, but is also a young guy. These are guys that are going to need to learn. And I think my biggest issue with all of it, with Steph, when you compare him, and we've gotten really used to Harden's ability to just kind of keep his team in games or win games for his team, is kind of the lone star out there. Um, It's easier for him to do that both at his size and, quite frankly, some of the stuff he's giving you on defense, that Steph really just isn't that stopper at any point, really. He can be a decent defender at times. Harden is not much more than a decent defender, but he's good in the post. And he is going to, you know, he'll, he'll get some steals here and there that help you out in a way that Steph really can't do that as much. And it's harder for him to impact the game when the guys he's passing to either aren't going to knock down shots or that you're going to rely on Steph to take so many shots to where um, it's crazy to think that Steph has a comfort zone, but he's not really forcing a whole lot of shots. It's just not who he is. Well, it's really interesting. First of all, Steph has been a good steals guy. You have to give him credit for that. He competes more than James does on defense. But physically, yes, he's just Absolutely. less switchable and less less of a force. You know, it really is interesting. Last night, toward the end of the Bulls game, I think with like 45 seconds left, Steph brought the ball up, one-on-one, no screen, no nothing, and rose up in a hesitation dribble. I think it was Kobe White bid on it completely, stood up to challenge a shot, and then Steph drove by him, got an and one, I think to pull the words within one, I don't know. And Steph is a great one-on-one player. I actually like, once in a while, you will see the Warriors call a play for Steph to catch the ball in like the triple threat position, 18, 19, 20 feet from the rim, two point range on the wing, two point range, not three point range. I actually love when he gets the ball there because he's such a good shooter that the your people are pressed right into his Jersey. All he has to do is pump fake and drive and get to the line. Like the referendum on Steph is going to be, if the Warriors are just bad, right? The referendum is going to be, well, LeBron's teams are never just bad. Kevin Durant's teams are never just bad. Kawhi Leonard's teams are never just bad. James Harden is... James Harden can go to strip clubs 80 nights a week, 80 nights a year. And his team, he's a walking playoff berth. It doesn't matter. He's a walking playoff berth. Why are Steph's teams bad? If he's a two-time MVP, why, I don't understand. Why are these teams bad? And we've seen other players like Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday had bad teams in New Orleans. Like, but so that's that's the discussion that's going to happen, and I think part of it is, well, let's TBD the whole thing. Like we don't know if they're bad yet, and, and we have seen other superstars helm bad teams um, before, but we don't know if the Warriors are bad yet. I, I do think I, I do think there is a lot of truth to the floor raiser versus ceiling raiser player archetype. Player archetype. That, that Steph's skills are such that he can take an okay team and a good team and make them supernova. But he's maybe less equipped than even a guy like Russ, 
to take a bad team and make them mediocre through sheer physicality. Like, like why can't you give the ball to Steph 20 feet from the rim in the triple threat position 50 times a game? Well, he's a pretty skinny dude. And do you want him getting destroyed at the rim to get you 14 free throws a game? Can he do that every night? I don't know. But I do know that his version of that is, I got two people on me 30 feet from the basket. And if you give me anybody that I can pass to that can make the next play, we're going to be all right. And I think we never got to see the Warriors try to adjust last year, right? They got punched in the face, humiliated, awful. And then Steph broke his hand in the fourth game. And then he came back. It was too late. They had Wiggins. It was like, it was like all crazy. Um, my hope for the season, obviously, is that we give Steph, and we, frankly, we give Steve Kerr, too, a chance to adapt. All right, you got punched in the face. Punch, maybe a little jab in the face. Well, more than a jab. They got, they got rocked pretty bad. Came back and won last night. Draymond's coming back. These guys are going to get experience playing together. Oubre is not this bad. Wiggins is not this bad. Wiseman's going to get better. They'll have more familiarity. Steph is coming off a lost season and a long layoff. He's going, to have, he's going to get better. There's a team in here somewhere. I had the Warriors in the play-in tier, right? The 7-10 to 10 tier. I was, I was a little lower on them than consensus, maybe. I still think that's where they are. They have looked worse than that through three games. But I want to see this coaching staff and this collection of players. With time, they will get better. There is a team in here that makes some sense. They're already number one in pace. They're forcing a ton of turnovers. So they have some semblance of like, we know how we have to play. I just hope as everyone gets a little more comfortable and some of the shots start to drop, I think this is an okay team. I still think it's an okay team. I don't think it's a particularly good team, but I think it's an okay team. Do you, I mean, you, you bring up the pace thing and that's, that's kind of an interesting argument for them. I, I think from the way you just worded it, you're suggesting that you think that's right for them. It doesn't mean that I think that they should be Rockets pace slow. Um, but I wonder on some level, with particularly without Draymond back, is there such a thing as them playing too fast given the talent disadvantage that they have for now, one, and two, just the fact that with some of the fast breaks that some of the longer misses create, and them not being that good on defense, I wonder if they hurt themselves by playing that bad. You're, that's true. That's a, it's a good point because a lot of teams have tried to minimize the talent gap by slowing slowing the pace to a crawl, right? And and this was the I Sixers. Yeah, I don't think they wanted that. Not quite to a crawl, but maybe a little slower than what they've been playing at. Well, and this was the Sixers process thing, right, where they played the fastest pace in the league and smart people like Tom Haberstroh were like, um, well, part of the reason they might be doing this is the more possessions there are in a game, the more time and opportunities there are for the fact that they stink to really sort of shine through and they'll lose. I, I guess I get to, I get your point. I just think with their athletes and their lack of shooting, I, I do think they're built to play pretty fast, so it's worth trying. But it's that's an interesting that's an interesting counter. Um, I don't. I, I just hope they get a chance to sort of evolve as as the season goes on. Let's talk about a team that is three and zero, and based on their prior track record, I think deserves a little love for being three and zero. And for, I don't know, the seventh consecutive year, it appears that I am guilty of underestimating the Indiana Pacers, who uh, came back to beat the Celtics, or held on, I guess, to beat the Celtics last night. Jason Tatum, what are these, like, like down one, we're just going to ISO for a 30-footer? That's the shot? What? Yeah. How did that's he did that in the playoffs, too, one game, I think, or maybe in the bubble. There was a, definitely another Tatum shot like that in the bubble, wasn't there? Yeah, I, I love Tatum, but I'm going to – well, we're getting to all this in the podcast later. But, yeah, his shot selection, I get that Kimba's not there. I get that Tatum can make these shots and obviously did it um, – you know, he's done it early on in the season even. But I I don't love – a lot of the shots he's taking. But anyway, I, you want to talk about Pacers. Let's do that. Well, no, I actually, the Celtics actually came up in my mind when we were talking about the Warriors because I, without Kemba, it's actually quite similar to me. Without Kemba, they have just, they, they are now below the critical mass. I don't know how the hell they beat the Bucks in the first game. I didn't watch that game. Um, they've now sort of reached below the critical mass of just how many good offensive players do we have on the floor? When one of Tatum and Brown is on the bench, their lineups are 
you look around and you're like, what, is Peyton Pritchard the second best offensive player? Like how like good defenders all over the place. Like tough lineups and Jalen and Jason are awesome. It's just I'm tired just watching those guys try to generate baskets. They need Kemba really, really badly. But let's not talk about them. Let's talk about the Pacers. Um, now, again, um, they've beaten Boston, the Knicks, and the Bulls, I think, or the Hornets. I, can't, I think the Bulls. Um, so let's not go bananas here. But uh, look, this team has a track record of being good. They're playing a little differently under Nate Bjorkren than they did under Nate McMillan in ways that I think are probably healthy. And DeMontis Sabonis... DeMontis Sabonis is just racking up a body count. He just wants to humiliate people in the post. And I love it because we have so few guys left in the league who just live for, I am going to knock your ass to the ground, dunk on you, and just look down at you sneering afterward like a villain. And and Dolmas is like that. Um, I guess I I thought the Pacers potential for combustibility was going to be problematic with Oladipo's free agency. Miles Turner almost got traded, but they've come out like, nope, we're the same team we were last year. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit surprising. Some of it's not. Um, (laughs) I always get text messages from some of the people that follow me or or not text messages, DMs and and tweets from people. They're like, are you are you kind of a closet Pacers fan? Because whenever you're on Zach's podcast, you always talk about the Pacers you know, win, lose, or draw, whether they're doing well, whether they're not. And, you know, I've written about them, I feel like, every season, you know, done, like, a longer feature on them. And when I've talked about them on here, you know, one of the times you had me on was after I wrote a feature about them. And they were, like, taking mid-range shots like there was no tomorrow. Um, You know, Nate McMillan basically told me that it was just kind of – he wanted them to play free and just kind of take the first open shot you have. That's not what this team is doing. Um, So they went from – uh, I think 10.4 mid-range shots per 100 possessions last year to now, which was 24th in the league. Now they're taking, uh, or I'm sorry, they're taking 10.4 mid-range shots per 100 possessions now, which is 24th in the league. Last year they ranked second in the league in mid-range shots, 18 per 100 possessions. So they're taking like half as many there, which is a huge adjustment. The other thing I I think that's really relevant here, um, like you said, they haven't played really, really strong competition yet. Maybe, you know, the Celtics, but they, this is a team that by far had the most uh, continuity from last year to this year. Except for Oladipo basically not playing all of last year. I think they're starting five, which so far this season is plus. I have it somewhere, but it's plus a lot, plus 30 in 27 minutes. I think their starting five only played like 85 minutes together last season. That's a very good point that Oladipo, yeah, he wasn't there for the majority of the year. So that part of it, but even with him, someone that they know, someone that they've at least been able to work out with in a year where there was very little training camp, you had two preseason games, you know, if your guys even played in them. And got, so it, it makes me think that some of these teams that are – really even the Rockets to some extent too, um, where guys that are kind of commandeering the offense or a group that has already played together that knows each other a little bit, that you're maybe going to have a little bit more success. That said, the Pacers have still looked so impressive. Miles Turner had eight blocks um, in the game against the Knicks to open the season. He's averaging almost six blocks a game so far. They've been really fun. They don't even have Jeremy Lamb yet. Um I'm enjoying this, and uh, who knows whether it'll be anything more than what we're seeing right now, but well, I'm really enjoying it. And Turner's interesting because he knows they almost traded him for Hayward. Yeah. I am very – like, I, I think it's pretty obvious he's probably not happy with his role in the offense as, as Sabonis has ascended to becoming both the star and the hub of how they play. He's a spot-up shooter for the most part, and no player with his level of talent and ambition is going to be psyched about that. He has not let it affect his play. In fact, he's bought in so completely on defense. He just gets better and better every year. Uh, And the continuity to me shines through mostly on the bench where they're rolling out a bench unit that played together last year. And, you know, Sabonis is is the hub of that with McDermott and Aaron Holiday and TJ McConnell, who's TJ McConnell. He almost gets a steal in the backcourt every game. I just like it's just a fun Someone had a tweet the other day that said, I, I, I like, 
had to do a double take because I'm like, I, I'm the king of weird ass statistics, and I don't even know if this one was a real one. I, and I feel horrible because I can't remember the name of whoever tweeted it. Um, it was that TJ McConnell, since they've been tracking these statistics, that he now has the most backcourt steals in NBA history, um, which that's like amazing because TJ McConnell's not old or anything. But I feel like they've probably been tracking that. St- they've probably been tracking that stat for like ten years. And so whatever. They probably tracking it, TJ McConnell's rookie year, but it tells you how sneaky the dude is. Um, I used to always be amazed when Pablo Prigioni would do that for the Knicks, but same sort of player, just pesky, undersized guy. That you know, that's the way he's going to get steals a lot of times. You got to respect those guys. You think that they would get clocked in the face once every five games by by dudes who are just. Just like, can you just stop, man? It's the second night of a back-to-back. I'm just trying to bring the ball up. We're all colleagues in the same league. Just take a couple steps back. And he refuses to do it. But people are people respect it because it's one of the ways he sticks in the league. Interestingly about the Pacers, um, they still are not shooting any threes. Uh, they are third to the bottom, I think, in the percentage of shots that are threes, which was the bugaboo under Nate McMillan, right? Is what they don't take a lot of threes. They're an antiquated offense. They, well, they still don't take a lot of threes. What they've done is take all those mid-range shots and take them to the basket. 48% of their shots through three games have come at the basket, which is so gargantuan that it's beyond unsustainable. It's ridiculous. But Brogdon has, is coming out for the second straight season like a house on fire. So Bonus is dunking everything into oblivion. And they're really just attacking the basket, playing at a fast pace, which is unpacers like in, in previous years. We'll see if it keeps up. But, you know, I had this team a solid seventh in the East. Um, I had this team seventh in the East. Toronto, Philly, Boston, Miami, Milwaukee, Brooklyn. Did I get them all? Hopefully I did. If I didn't, people can figure out who I forgot. Um, and, you know, it seems like we do this with the Pacers every year where they're sort of ranked at the bottom of that group and then they're better than expected and inevitably somebody in the above group takes an injury or underperforms or whatever and all of a sudden the Pacers are sitting there at third, fourth, fifth as you're coming up on the playoffs and maybe that'll happen again this year. Um, let's, let's, jump to the, um, let's jump to the top of the conference or the team that we expected to be at the top of the conference. Are you concerned at all that the Milwaukee Bucks are one and two? A little bit, but not terribly. Um, so exactly what we were saying was true of Indiana is kind of the polar opposite for Milwaukee, uh, particularly as we talk about continuity. Um, Milwaukee in the last, what, three or four years going off John Schumann's continuity rankings is ranked. They were fifth last year in continuity from one season to the next Fourth the year before that, they were first the year before that. 93% of their minutes came back. This year, 50% of their minutes came back. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is funny because with a, a lot of that is Drew Holiday um, being new to that team. And Drew Holiday, you look at it on paper and you say, that's an upgrade for them. And it is. I think, you know, very clearly is an upgrade from Bledsoe. The real big difference for them is kind of the bench and the rim protection issue. Um, how much do you trust Bobby Portis to kind of step in essentially as your second string back line guy? And so for me, I think that's the sort of thing that probably doesn't come together quickly. It may not come together at all. So that's my concern. The one other concern I have for them, which I'm sure will get ironed out, um, is that Giannis uh, hasn't looked so great so far. I think just kind of as a distributor, uh, I think he's been slightly under a one-to-one ratio from assist to turnover, which he's never been one of those guys that's three-to-one or two-to-one or anything like that. But, um, you know, just maybe being unsure of where to go with the ball with some of these guys as they're new. So I think that that'll iron itself out. But defensively, I don't know that this team ends up being as special. The continuity and the turnover for them might serve as more of a hindrance when you consider the fact that this is a team that somewhat is kind of playing the margins and looking at we're going to leave certain guys open. We know we're going to do that, but we have a pretty good sense of who we're leaving open um, and having that IQ and maybe new guys needing to kind of get up to speed on that. So it may take them a while. Not concerned yet, but that Knicks loss was pretty pretty odd. That Knicks game, I can't remember very many regular season games that made me feel the sensation of unreality the way that like Julius Randle was making 20-foot fadeaways 
Alfred Payton was having one of his seven games per year where you watch and you're like, oh, whoa, oh, <laughs> this is why the, this is why the Magic had such a you know what for this guy. Um, and Frank Nilakina went crazy. I'm so I'm glad that they finally played Frank Nilakina. I don't understand why they weren't even playing him. Like you got to figure out what you have. I know you're trying to win, but. You know, I, I, you know, quickly and top and we're getting minutes quickly, particularly in the backcourt. He looks good. So I, I guess I get it, but I'm glad Frank finally played. But anyway, the Bucks, I, the turnover excites me just as a viewer. I'm, I'm excited to watch, but I was always excited to watch Bucks games. But by the middle of last year, you knew the general formula for a Bucks game, how it would look, how they would play. And now there are all these new ingredients and I want to see how the new ingredients work. And so you already see a lot of Drew Holiday, Giannis pick and rolls, which I thought was one of the best reasons to get a, another ball handler. And you can see teams are going to test Drew Holiday. They're going to go under and say, beat me with jumpers. They're going to leave him open for threes. They're not going to treat him with a great deal of respect. Um, and you can see defensively, they're not quite going to be the same team. I think they trend a little smaller off the bench. Like when they have Forbes and Augustine in, it's like, oh, right. this team got kind of got a little puny. Like DJ Augustine and Forbes together. It's not as sort of – it's not as, as fearsome as it used to be. And um, But I, I think defensively their core lineups will still be good. And they, they have got to sort of fig- figure out a Giannis at center lineup. We haven't seen too much of that in the first couple of games. Uh, offensively, you can already tell – they're trying some interesting stuff. So eagle-eyed viewers, if you watch a Bucks game this year, watch how often they have someone in the dunker spot now. The dunker spot is right under the rim, right under the corner of the backboard kind of, right under the backboard at the edge of one uh, of the paint. Bledsoe was there sometimes in prior years, sometimes kind of randomly, sometimes by script. They have a guy there a lot now, and it's obviously by design. I can only guess at what the reason for that is because on the surface you would think, well, putting a guy in the dunker spot, even Middleton is there sometimes. Putting a guy in the dunker spot, well, all that does is clog up driving lanes. For, like, why are they why are they voluntarily clogging up the paint? That seems weird. I wonder if they think mechanically it makes it harder for defenses to build a wall in some ways for Giannis. And it, it, like, are they going to build up from the baseline to do that? Or if it gives him an easier drop-off pass somewhere, I'm not convinced it's a thing that's really going to work or change their life as a half-court offense, but it is interesting. Um, but their offense has been crazy good so far. Their offense hasn't been the problem. Their defense has not been very good, but that's mostly because of random shooting. I just, I think the Bucks are about what I expected. The regular season is going to be more of a development for them than it, more of a development thing than it has been in the past couple of years. I think that's healthy. I think they needed that. And I, I just I'm more interested to watch their games. I'm more interested to see how the pieces come together. But as long as they're scoring points, and even last night against the Knicks, they were like four of thirty five from three at one point. They were getting good shots. Um, I'm, I think they're fine. Uh, I would like to see Giannis look a little more comfortable in the post and from the foul line. But I'm not one and two doesn't doesn't worry me. But they are they're an interesting watch this year, Mister Herring. Yeah, I mean, I think you raise a good point too. That the the idea. This team had a floor or had, you know, they've been winning, you know, 65, 70 games a year, you know, prorated out. They've had enough cushion between them and the team right behind them, second, third, whatever. Um, this is why you have that cushion there to kind of experiment and to play with different things, because at this point we don't really care. Like you said, that's probably why you, you, you don't lose interest, but like you, you're not really curious for anything once you get to the second half of the season with the team because they, they're they the team that's lapped everybody else. And so it's all about what they can kind of do to to really improve for the playoffs. That's all that matters at this point. Even though Giannis is locked in at this point, I think that's everybody knows that's all that really matters from them. So the idea of being overly concerned about where they're at or how they've looked so far, I think their announcers even said last night, as long as they can get through the first 20 games, 12 and 8, and I was like, oh, that sounds kind of like a bad record to me for them. But in, in, in reality, it probably doesn't matter that much. Well, it's also going to be a very weird season. Maybe not. Maybe less so for the Bucks and other teams. But in terms of you know guys sitting out back to backs, sure. obviously we've already seen one team, the Rockets, decimated by COVID related protocols. Have seen a couple other players, stray guys on other teams, sit out. And by the way, a stat that I'm going to be monitoring all year long: home teams so far are 20 and 19 
going into tonight's action on Monday. So about 500. And it's just very curious what home court advantage even means with no fans, but not only no fans, a lot of teams playing little baseball style series where the team plays the first game, they stay over, have an off day in the same city, play the second game. So they're not traveling. They're not coming into that second game off a flight and a late night and all that. And so 20 and 19, you know, again, that's way too small of a sample to, to read anything into, but um, you know, we'll, 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 best we'll, opportunity to, to just screw up everything by losing by 50 at home. Also, <laughs> that was normally I'll watch any Sunday matinee because it helps me check off a game ahead of time, get ahead of the ahead of the action. I saw the score of that game, and I thought, I think I got to skip this one. I don't think this is this is going to go. <laughs> you well didn't miss me. much. You didn't miss as much as the Clippers did. I'll put it that way in terms of their shot. They they appeared to uh, miss. I missed some Boban time though. Um, yeah. Let's talk about one last team, and that's the Pelicans, who are. Uh, I, I'm going to be watching the Pelicans obsessively this year. For I mean, how can you not watch Zion? The guy is just is like Thor on a basketball court. Uh, they are two and one. Uh, their offense has been quite bad. They're 27th in offense. Their defense has been fifth or sixth. I can't even read my own handwriting. Um, I am for reasons we can talk about. I am very interested in how they are playing on both ends of the floor. Again, they're two and one. They just beat the Spurs last night. But have boy, are the Spurs fun? I severely I, underestimated the Spurs fun factor. I like the Spurs, and it, it, it's so funny because I, I like had to look back at some notes I took from last year, the year before. Is it just me, or does Demar Derozan like decide to play point guard way more at the beginning of seasons, and then it kind of fades a little bit where he he's had like a bunch of double digit assist games early on in seasons the last couple of years. And then it kind of fades away. And so it's like, he starts with big assist months to start the year. And then it dwindles towards it. And not that he's like a, not passing at all at the end of the season, but like he's average seven, eight assists a game to start. Well, the Chris, Chris, not just that he's taken eight threes in three games. The threes. That's an out. That's first announcement. That's, that's an so excited about. It. <laughs> I love it. That's an outburst. It. That's an outburst for DeMar DeRozan. He took 35 all last season. He's already taken eight. And it, he goes through these stretches again where it was like, oh my God, DeMar has decided to shoot threes. And then a week later it'll be, nope, DeMar's not shooting threes, but the Spurs right. are super fun. Spurs, Kel- Spurs. Keldon Johnson, Keldon Johnson has been one of my 10 favorite players in the league to watch uh, so far this year. He just is jumping through I mean, he doesn't care if it's Aaron Baines or whoever. He's just jumping right through those dudes at the rim. Um, but the Pelicans beat them last night. They're 2-1. and one. You know, people had questions about their depth after their, their top seven guys, who I think are interesting to, to very good. What, did, what has struck you about New Orleans through three games? Um, their freaky Friday-ass sort of, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the idea that we knew that their offense would be good and their defense would be maybe have some question marks to it, and then it's been flipped. Um, you know, I, I don't know that their offense was ever that great. I, I think they've got a lot of really good individual players on offense, and it was kind of going to be a, a question of how they figured that out, how do they play it, how much is the ball going to be in Ingram's hands. Um, but defensively, you know, as we talk about what's going to hold up and what won't with regards to the Nets and other teams, defensively I don't it, it's weird the Pelicans have a bunch of guys that individually are really really good defenders um and now that they have a new coach and a coach that you know has kind of stressed defense before um maybe they can be a top 10 defensive team this year I don't know that I'm expecting that this quickly um and so that that's what I'm looking at right now is just kind of how much can that hold up because you know this team's not going to be 27th in offense when all is said and done they probably have too much individual talent on offense. And, and quite frankly, you know, an elite shooter, um, you know, a guy that just wreaks havoc, a team that plays fast and can get out in the open court. Um, but if they can finish anywhere near the top 10 defensively, and even if they're top half defensively, I think it bodes really well for their chances of making the playoffs, despite the fact that I think they're kind of one of those fringe teams. The way they're playing defense is super interesting to me. So Stan Van has done what Stan Van does, which is all the low-hanging fruit that's just sitting there, pluck, 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 pluck. Uh, Second lowest foul rate in the league through three games. Now, again, any stat right now is so dependent on who you've played because the sample size is so so small. 
but second highest, second lowest foul rate, number one defensive rebounding rate, suggests to me that Stan has said, hey, we're getting the fundamentals right. We're not going to be second and first probably the whole season, but we're not going to be 25th and 20th. We're plucking those fruit. We're eating them up. We're gobbling them up. We're plucking them. Um, and some of that is, I think, sustainable. The interesting thing to me is um, they are allowing the most threes in the league at a rate even higher than I think Toronto allowed last year. And if you watch, again, it's only three games. If you watch them, both Stan and Jeff, the Van Gundys, on this podcast have talked a lot about the Bucks' defense in the last three or four years, about how the Bucks led the league in opponent three, allowed a ton of threes, tons of threes. The Raptors did it. The Celtics did it. And still finished with an elite defense because they just walled off the rim. You could not score at the rim, and you didn't get free throws, and you didn't get offensive rebounds. He has New Orleans playing like the Bucks. They are loading so aggressively to the ball and loading so aggressively to the paint that you pause it and you're like, oh my God, they're leaving everybody wide open around the perimeter. They're going to get torched, but they haven't gotten torched so far because A, NBA players are really fast. And when you coach them really hard and you have a scheme that makes sense, they will fly in and out and challenge some of those shots. And they also haven't gotten torched so far because they're not giving up anything at the basket um, and they're not fouling. And so all of that talk from the Van Gundys about the Bucks and how interesting the Bucks were, he seems to have imported that philosophy to the Pelicans. And I am very interested in, in how well that holds up. The other stat that I'm monitoring with them is their half-court offense is dead last in points per possession. Yeah. And even when they were flying last year, even when Zion came back and they were rolling, their half-court offense was bad. And it's just that's where the lack of outside shooting other than Ingram who teams still treat like an okay shooter and not a good one. And I think that will change to a good one, but not a great one pretty soon. Cause I, I think Brandon Ingram's shooting is legitimate. I think he's become a good shooter. The jury's done on that. Brandon Ingram is a dangerous shooter, but the lack, I mean, Lonzo Bledsoe, Zion Adams, there's no shooting anywhere on the floor. Um, and that's, you know, you can't live in transition all the time. And so that's what I'm going to be looking for with them, but they have already established themselves as a hard playing team with a philosophy that they appear to be buying into. And they're just another team where I'm just really curious to watch them every night. Yeah. I, I, you could have told me, you could tell me now, I was going to say, you could have told me before the season that, you know, that they find themselves into maybe, you know, a top five spot in the West. I couldn't see them finishing much higher than fifth, but like you could sell me on that just with all these other teams that are kind of, they all seem kind of bunched together. I think you and I were talking before. It's still not really clear. I think most people would probably put their money on the Clippers. But after, you know, the top two spots out west, who I think most of us kind of assume it'll be the Lakers and maybe somebody else, um, you could kind of sell me on basically anybody um, of the teams that made the playoffs last year or were in the play-in last year from a talent standpoint alone. And I think New Orleans is right there too. And giving them a really clear identity – and the things that they're going to do that they're not going to um, they're not going to be kind of hit or miss on. Um, that's how you build an identity to some extent that you're not going to foul um, that you're just going to try to make sure that you do certain things that you take care of the defensive rebounding, which Steven Adams helps you do that. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens here, but it is interesting to me too, that again, they've got so much talent on the offensive side um, and they're still figuring out how exactly how to blend it from a half court standpoint that you really do want to get out and run. You've got guys that help you run with Lonzo and everybody else um, and transition. But when that's taken away, um, do they almost, it's weird. Do they almost have too much individual talent to really, to where it hurts them sometimes? I mean, we've seen Ingram can pass the ball. I think he had what 11 assists in the first game or was it the second game that they had? Uh, first game, first game over Toronto. Against Toronto. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting. They've got the talent to do it, but it's they still haven't played together all that much when you think about Adams being there. You think about Zion having come in really at the late part of last year. It's still a relatively new team. Uh, that Bledsoe, honestly, um, is still a very, very new team. So I'm, I'm excited to watch them play. I mean, I think that they're, they're as fun to watch. And, you know, it's really anybody, and they're still really young in certain parts of that roster. Well, one way to help their half-court offense is that with Zion and Adams on the floor, 
they should be offensive rebounding at an absolutely hellacious rate. And so far, they've been offensive rebounding at a good rate. I think it needs to be great because you think about how the hell are you supposed to get a defensive rebound when those two guys are under the rim? They're like a tag, they're like a WWE tag team. I, what, I, I, Zion is like four feet wide. Steven Adams is the nastiest dude in the whole league. Zion can get from the floor to the rim faster than you can blink your eye. How are you supposed to get a defensive rebound against them? I think right now they're rebounding 30% of their misses with those two on the floor. If that, I think that number should be like 35 or more because wow. those two guys are so good. Um, and I also think Richard Jefferson said this on the Christmas game, and I think he's dead on. I think Zion should have a chance to lead the league in free throw rate every season, free throws per minute, given that he might be under minutes restrictions here or there. I don't know. I just don't know how you keep that guy off the foul line. He faces up anybody, anybody, and he's at the rim. Big guys are too slow. Wings are too little. He's just at the rim, and all you can do is foul him. And in that game, in that Christmas game, he I don't know how many free throw attempts. He got enough that Richard Jefferson said, I, I think this guy should lead the league in free throws. And as long as James Harden's playing 38 minutes a game, no one else is going to lead the league in free throws probably. But per minute, I just don't know what you're supposed to do with him. He's just, he should be, he should average, if he plays enough minutes, he should average 10 or 11 free throws a game. Yeah. Like you said, keeping him off the glass, man. It, and it's it's funny too, because again, they don't have so much shooting. But Zion's such a smart player where he kind of creeps into these gaps and he cuts. And um, if you don't put a body on him, he's going to just jump over the top of your back and dunk on you. Um, you've got another big body in there in Adams. I, I think for me, the, the thing that will eventually be the question, if they are good enough to make the playoffs, is just kind of how does Bledsoe gel with the team? Because, it, you know, we've seen for years now that, He's a good, at least a decent regular season player and sometimes a lot better than decent, you know, all-star level player. Um, I I just think everybody else, we see Ingram growing into what he's doing and, you know, able to have a double-digit passing game and able to drop 35 or 40 on you. We know Zion, you know, per minute kind of puts up those sorts of crazy statistics. We know what Adams is going to bring. We know what JJ is going to bring. And for me, the big question mark is Bledsoe. And I understand why they made the trade there, um, you know, in getting Drew out of there and getting Bledsoe in. Um, but I, he's kind of, it's so interesting that he was kind of the, he was the player that I was most curious about with Milwaukee in terms of how high their ceiling could be in the postseason. And I think just as far as whether or not this team makes it into the playoffs and then once they get there, like what they actually accomplish and how much of a scare they put into whoever they're playing. I think he's kind of that pivotal guy there as well in New Orleans. That's a that's a good point. I actually think it would be fun post plague if I went to New Orleans and they had Lonzo Ball shoot jump shots with me, Zion, and Stephen Adams under the oh. rim, and we and we we figured out how many jump shots would it take before I got one rebound, or would I just be in the hospital before that happened? I I think I really would like. I, I bet if Zion hit me, I mean, forget Adams. Adams is going to elbow me in the face. Why donating your body to science, Zach? Why do you want this experience? <laughs> but Adams is going to elbow me and you're like, you know, he, he's got all the dirty tricks. I just, if Zion just full forced boxed me out, I my, one of my ribs might break. I don't know what would happen, but I want to see if he missed a hundred times. Would I get one rebound? Would it have to be one of the crazy ones that flies all the way to half court and I just run and get it? I don't need, I don't know. I have no concept of how long it would take me to get one rebound. Would you pay to watch that? Would you pay a, would you pay one cent to watch that? No, but I'll be happy to take over uh, your when you're on medical leave after, after that process. All right. <laughs> all right, Chris Herring, we, we bounced around a lot of the interesting teams. We'll do this again soon as teams get more, more uh, W's under their belt. Um, you can read Chris's work at 538. The book on the Knicks is going to come out very, well, not very soon, but soon-ish in the scheme of things. I look forward to it. Mr. Herring, thank you again for your time. Zach, appreciate you as always. Happy New Year to you, buddy. 